Twitter prides itself on being a company that, uh, that does good um, in the world um, and that makes good decisions as far as a corporation. Do you really believe that a corporation can be good? Um, well, I don't know what the, what, I mean, what's the converse? Does, if if well, I don't well, believe like, that, does it mean a corporation is bad? No, are but, all, but do you bad? believe, okay, but, uh, that, so you know. So let me answer, the, I guess, yeah. let me answer it this way. Uh -huh. Let me see if this answers your question. Okay. I don't believe that um, the <clears throat> pursuit of doing the right thing for your users and trying to affect beneficial change in the world is at loggerheads with being a pro profitable enterprise. Uh, so that's, I guess, how I think about it. But one of the things I recognize is we were trying to start to scale the company and grow internationally and open other offices was that there wasn't a shared understanding of what it meant to be to work at Twitter. So we set about um, uh, with, with, this, with this female engineer who was one of the first engineers in the company and one of the, one of the first employees at the company uh, came up to me and talked to me about the notion of codifying our core values while I was thinking about this. And she said, you know, the, the research actually says that um, companies who have codified these things where there's a real shared belief and understanding about what they are, they're not just, you know, written down on uh, uh, postcards and no one ever talks about them again. They actually, they actually um, correspond with financial results. And so we set about doing that, and when we went to define them, we said there are two things about them that we want to be true. One is we want them to help inform decisions. So they weren't going to be abstractions like honesty, integrity, and so forth. And then secondly, we wanted them to be things that were already true about the company, not wouldn't it be great if we all believed that? Of course, none of us believe that now. Um, so they ended up being, uh, you know, one of them, just as an example, and then we can move on, is... Um, I think we're done with the interview already, so thank you. Is, uh, <laughs> is grow our business in a way that makes us proud. Yes. And uh, the reason that is, it evolved toward that uh, incarnation was one of the things we felt about things like, um, 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 oh gosh, uh, don't be evil. I'll keep on referring to Google since I worked there for a couple of years and pulled many of the things I liked about Google over to Twitter. Um, one of the things we felt was a little bit awkward about that was you, you could do a lot of things and then say, well, it's not really evil. I mean, we didn't kill anybody, um, and then justify <laughs> that. But that grow our business in a way that made, makes us proud had a, had a you know, you could, you could look at that and say, is this something we want to get up and really tell people about, or are we going to try to, yeah. you know, hide that or uh, not announce it? Are you still uh, teaching the management classes at Twitter? So Dick teaches a management class where he, um, he actually goes in and does a six-hour course with, with all of the... Uh, Twitter managers um, teaching them how to be a good manager both in real life and, and, and offline. Um, are you still teaching that course with 1,600 employees? Um, I am. Um, and when I mentioned earlier that, that one of the things I'm primarily focused on right now is the organization, both structurally and culturally, that's a huge part of it. So the managing at Twitter course started because, um, rather, uh, you know, almost innocuously, I had an engineer come up to me and say, hey, the manager I worked for over on uh, revenue engineering had one-on-ones with me every week, and the manager I'm working for now on w whatever it happened to be, infrastructure engineering, you know, doesn't believe in one-on-ones. So uh, which is it? Which, what are they supposed to be doing? What are managers supposed to be doing here at Twitter? And then <clears throat> it was one of those funny things where, you know, it wasn't something I thought about all the time, and then once I saw this individual instance of it, I started seeing this success bias that managers brought to the company everywhere. So, you would, I would start hearing it all the time, like, well, at Google, you know, and then insert <laughs> whatever they did at Google. And then I would also start to notice that new managers, you know, as we're growing really quickly, you're, you're promoting people from within uh, consistently and constantly, um, they would do whatever their manager did, not whatever you know, we believe to be true at Twitter or what they necessarily thought they should do. So I created this course called Managing at Twitter that's basically, here's how I want you to manage. Here's how I expect you to, ma expect you to manage, and here's why it's important to me, and here's why it's important to the company. And it's, got, it's really simple. It's got three, um, three components to it. I don't have any slides. I just stand in front of 25 or so managers every, every four or five weeks, and three hours one afternoon and three hours the next morning. And I talked through them um, setting direction, why it's important to set direction. And setting direction is just about um, defining the problem for your team, 
setting metrics against which you're going to hold them accountable to that, that problem and then letting them go build and create that solution so that they're much more committed and much more excited about figuring that out than if you tell them, go do this, right? It's not go do this, it's set direction. And I do the same thing with the company. Uh, the second part of it is giving and getting feedback. Managers, especially here in Silicon Valley, are really bad about giving direct feedback. Um, and even actually, uh, uh, even soliciting constructive feedback. But, um, and I think it, it might not even be, be particular to Silicon Valley, but I've just noticed it uh, here in the Valley. And it's probably um, endemic to management around the world. But what I mean by giving direct feedback is, um, let's say you and Mike uh, want a pancake, okay? And uh, you both come to sure. me and said, you know, I think, I'll just use a crazy, silly example. Um, you know, I think I should get the pancake because I did my last two things on time and on budget, and I've worked here a long time, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And Mike comes to me, and I think I should get a pancake because I've never had a pancake before, and they sound amazing. And if I don't, in fact, if I don't get a pancake, I'm going to go to Google because they've offered me four pancakes, and, <laughs> uh, and you know, blah, blah, blah. And what I've, no what I've observed is that even managers who generally are doing a pretty good job will do things like, um, when they make a decision, um, uh, have separate meetings with you guys. And they'll say, hey, Nick, um, I'm really excited about this. I went to bat for you. I got you the pancake. I no one it. thought you should have a pancake Did more than you. You, you. you get the pancake. <laughs> and uh, I'm really happy for you. Thank you. And uh, listen, I really went to bat for you on that. But you know, um, congratulations. And then they'll call Mike in and say, Mike, no one wants me to have a pancake more than you. Like, I am your biggest fan. I know Google offered you, right? And they'll kind of, they'll tell you two different yeah. stories. And, and, and Michael leave the room thinking he was supposed to get the pancake, but for some reason <clears throat> that jerk Nick Felton got it. And Nick will leave the room thinking he's Dick's favorite employee. And, and actually, sometimes it's even worse. The manager will allocate 200% of available pancakes, right? <laughs> they will give it to both of them, right? And, uh, you know, we laugh about this, but it's true. And so I spend a bunch of time with my managers helping them understand, look, this, this quadrant of communication, if you think of communication as being super clear on one side of the x-axis and unclear on the other side, and then the y-axis being at the bottom, I perceive the way this person receives this communication will be poor. I think they'll be upset with me when I tell them this. And the y, top of the y-axis is they'll be happy when I tell them this. It's almost impossible for new managers and frankly some experienced managers to keep a conversation in the I'm going to be as clear as possible yep. irrespective of where I end up on the y axis yep. right yep. the point isn't to like be a jerk and make sure they leave the room unhappy I got the pancake everything you good. got the pancake but the point is also to make <clears throat> sure everyone has a clear understanding of exactly the decision that's been made and why it's been made and trust gets built when I'm clear with you despite your, you know, uh, how much you're yelling at me or how much you're depressed. Yep. And anyway, the final part of the um, course is improving your team. Um, I have this belief that, you know, there are a couple ways to think about running your team. And one is, you know, you can run it, um, uh, as a friend of mine uh, in the industry calls it the Marxist way, which is to each according to his needs. And I'm going to spend most of my team with my low performers or the people who come and complain to me a lot because they've got issues. And, you know, those guys who are over and those women who are <coughs> over there in the corner are like doing an amazing job and never ask me any questions. I'm just going to let them go because they're great. And then there's the way I want you to run your team, which is the Darwinian way. Right? And you know, make sure you're spending your, most of your time with your top performers and your top potential people who are going to make the team better in the long run. So you used to be a, an improv comedian, is that right? Yes, sir. Uh, so um, can you, can you, do, do you miss that? Do you, do you in, like... No, I get to do it now. People are, yeah, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, some of, that I, some of that I miss. I mean, it's like... There's okay, a real, I'll it, tell you the beauty, the great yeah. thing about improvisation <clears throat> is... Um, there's an amazing thing about being on stage with, you know, zero to N other people and doing something that just has just been created in that environment yeah. between you and the other people on stage that has never existed before and you didn't think of backstage and wasn't written down and it gets this amazing laugh and then it builds on itself and is incredibly funny. That's like, there's nothing else like that. What did you learn from, uh, from uh, improv that you applied <laughs> to business? 
Oh gosh, lots of stuff. Um, Give me one thing because we, we only have 30 minutes. Well, we we've talked about this a little bit. We've cards talked about this through. a little bit. We've talked about this a little yeah. bit before. But the first thing is listening. Um, you cannot go out into an improvisation scene uh, with multiple other people on the stage and have any success at all unless you're listening very closely to what's being said. Otherwise, you're going to step on some some initiation or moment somebody else on stage has created, and then the audience is just going like, these guys aren't even like paying attention to each other. The guy went over there a moment ago and pulled you know, a knife out of that, improvised a knife out of that drawer, and now Dick's going over there and turning on the TV where the knife, knife drawer is. Now I don't believe any, right? And the audience will literally like go, oh, and off they go. Yeah. You might not even notice that they're doing it, but they do. Once you start creating a reality that everyone's paying attention to, or you're listening to each other, the audience is like with you. And so um, it's one of the things I tell my managers. Like, you can't communicate if you don't listen. If you look 10 years from now, what do you, what do you see it as? Do you think it's the same kind of thing with more, I mean? I don't, th I'm, not, <clears throat> I'm not one of those people who thinks about, this is what this has to look like 10 years from now, because I think you end up building like the Disneyland home of tomorrow. Like, you know, <laughs> and it looks exactly like the home of today, but it's all plastic, Yeah. you know? And, I, you know, I don't, I not, don't think that's ever the right way to think about it no, because you don't have the context for some, for some evolution that will ever so slightly change how things work now, but have this profound impact on how things work seven years after the evolution. And that could be um, the way that uh, the cell phone is this, you know, is, is this um, do, manifestation do you, do you see, of... I mean, do you see, like, you know, I, mean, we're, we're, I think we're about to enter an era of wearable computing. Do you see, yeah. do you kind of envision a world where you'll be tweeting from your eyeballs or... <coughs> like the Google Glass kind of yeah, stuff? Yeah, like, like Google Glass. Blink and like, yeah, like yeah. Blink and you're like... Take you're a just photo of what we're your, doing right now? Your I think that, um, yeah, I think that wearable computing will have a profound impact on... Um, on all sorts of things. You'll have more social context for uh, the environment you're in. Um, and Twitter and so will forth. be a big part of that. I think that Twitter will probably be a big part of that, sure. Yeah. yeah. What profession other than yours would you like to attempt? Oh, well, I mean, you've already, I've, already, I've already attempted it, so. That's it? Yeah. Okay. And you, know what I would, you know what I would love to attempt that I haven't attempted? Yeah. I would love to attempt to be a writer. Or a hardware hacker. No, a writer. <laughs> No, I would love to try to be a writer. <clears throat> All right, and we have one last I question. I can't see myself a decent writer. I think so the problem when you that. think your you're tweets are good. decent at something is you start to feel like you're, you could be great you're, at it. You're funny. You're, you're yeah. good on Wikipedia. All right. Um, uh, and um, what for, let's, last question. What profession would you not like to do? Oh, there are so many. Pick one. Like Being a writer. There are so many that are <clears> just <throat> under, I feel like that are underappreciated. Um, I, like, I could never, ever... I could never ever be like a, a policeman or a fireman or something like that, I don't think. Those are these incredibly noble professions that are, um, um, that are these long stretches of, of training and learning and training and learning and training with these very brief flashes of massive, high-intensity, life-threatening, panic-riddled, you know, emotional context. Just like being a CEO. Uh, that would probably give me a heart attack. <clears throat> yeah. I have no capacity for that kind of stuff.